Hey everyone, my name is Chris Anderson and I'm in Saguaro National Park, home to the largest cacti in the United States, the giant saguaro. But these aren't the only living things that call this park home. There are dozens of species of cacti, bushes, and trees, as well as mountain lions, javelinas, and gila monsters. So how are all these living things able to survive in a hot, dry location like the Sonoran Desert? Let's find out today on Outsider Classroom. <laughs> Ah, uh, there's nothing quite like walking through a cactus forest. The titular character of this park, the saguaro cactus, can grow over 50 feet tall. But how does a plant that big survive in the Sonoran Desert, a place that gets less than 12 inches of rain in the entire year, and for where the average daily high can be over 100 degrees for months at a time? One of the saguaro's best adaptations, it's also its most obvious, these spines. As you can see, these spines are super sharp and can get up to three inches long. Any animal who would want to take a bite out of a saguaro would need some special adaptations, otherwise they could get seriously hurt. These spines could puncture deep, and if they break off in your skin, they could leave some nasty splinters. Yikes. The saguaro is covered in these spines, which make a really good deterrent against would-be diners. But that's not the only adaptation these cacti have. To learn more how these giants thrive out here, Let's hop over to the Desert Botanical Garden. Hi, my name's Marie Long. I'm the Director of Education at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, Arizona. So my favorite adaptation about the saguaro is if you look at the saguaro really closely, it looks like an accordion. Throughout the year, they expand and contract. And so when they're nice and plump and fat, that means that they have a lot of water. And then like an accordion, they can shrink when they lose water. It's a pretty neat little thing. We actually can see the saguaros small and big throughout the year. I'm actually, believe it or not, oh my gosh, I'm standing on saguaro roots right now. The saguaro roots are so small, they're only about four inches underneath the surface, and if you see how tall these saguaro cactus, up to 40 feet, the roots actually will go out 40 feet out, and they only have a very short tap root. I mean, it's hard to imagine how that saguaro cactus can even stand up because it's so big. Saguaro National Park is home to 1,500 different plant species. That's a lot of biodiversity for a place that doesn't get much rain. So how can all these plants exist in such a dry environment? Part of the reason is the range of elevation. Here, we're about 2,600 feet above sea level, but at its highest point, the park's around 9,000 feet above sea level. That range makes for a wide variety of microclimates, with temperatures getting cooler as you go up the mountains. Here in the valley, you'll find cacti like the saguaro, the barrel, the prickly pear, and you'll find bushes like the creosote, the palo verde, and the mesquite, who have extensive root systems to access water deep in the soil. Further up, you'll find cottonwoods and oaks, trees you might expect to find in a forest in the eastern part of the country, but not next to a desert. Up here, it's cooler and wetter, the perfect climate for these trees. And even further up, you'll find pine trees. Up here, it stays cold enough that snow covers the ground most of the winter. Perfect for these guys. All these plants are able to coexist because they've adapted to their part of the mountains. Think about it. The cacti would be way too cold at the higher elevations, and the pine trees would all dry out down here in the valley. Scientists call this resource partitioning where species avoid competing with one another by adapting to different environments. Think about a bowl of assorted candy. One person will eat the ones with the Rice Krispies, another person will eat the kind with the peanuts inside. I'll eat all the dark chocolate candies because I can't help myself, don't judge me. Anyways, everyone gets their favorite type of candy without competing with one another. Unless you take my dark chocolate. But of course, plants aren't the only things that call saguaro home. This park is home to lots of different animals with their own adaptations for surviving in the, in the desert. And to help us understand some of that is Ranger Camp. So, Ranger Camp, what kind of animals live in saguaro? A lot. Uh, we have all sorts of mammals. We have insects, birds, reptiles, even a couple of amphibians that live in the area sometimes. 
Um, where in fact we are the bee capital of the nation, the hummingbird, and the ant capital of the nation with how many species we have. Uh, an example is we have over 700 species of bees within a 100 mile radius of Tucson. So this is a lot of biodiversity for a place that really doesn't get that, that much rain. It doesn't. No, the whole city of Tucson averages around 10 inches of uh, rainfall annually. Wow. So how are these animals able to survive in an environment that doesn't get that much rain? It gets quite hot during the day. Uh, what kind of adaptations do they have? There's a, so there's a lot of animals out here that have adapted to be able to eat the cactus, uh, whereas we cannot. Um, you know, the prickly pear cactus we can eat, and there's a couple of other ones, but in general, like the saguaro, the barrel cactus, um, Western movies have lied to us. You can't get water or anything out of them. Inside is very acidic. You'd get a lot of stomach issues. Uh, obviously, the needles would get in the way a lot of times. Whereas javelina and mule deer and some of the, some of the rodents, they just go right up to it and chew on it. Uh, you will even see sometimes javelina with spines still sticking out, um, but the saliva will end up just kind of disintegrating them and they'll fall off. Wow. Uh, another really great adaptation that I love is the kangaroo rat. Um, they don't have to ingest any liquid water at all. Sometimes they'll take seeds and nuts and they'll bury them underground and the humidity will get absorbed into them. Uh, in addition, their metabolism is able to almost pull oxygens and hydrogens off of what they eat and combine it into water in their own system. So they can just create water in their, in their bodies. Yeah, yeah, to a small degree, of course. It's not all of it. They do get some from the seeds and nuts, um, but they also retain all that moisture. So if you go up to like a, a glass or a mirror and you breathe on it, you put the little heart thing, you know, all that stuff. That doesn't happen with them. Um, some scientists were doing research, they put them up against glass, and they don't have any moisture that comes out of their breath. So you wouldn't, like on a cold morning, you wouldn't see like mist in their in, Nope, not at breath. all, yeah. Wow, so these, uh, these animals are really good at not just finding moisture, but like retaining it inside their bodies. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Uh, what about some other animals that live in the park? Well, desert tortoise is another one that's really able to retain that moisture. Um, they're able to store a lot of urine and stuff in their bladder, which that can be held for six months or more sometimes. Man, holding your pee for six months? Exactly. Yikes. Which is one of the reasons we like to tell people, if you see one uh, crossing the road, just stop. Don't try and help it across. Um, if you pick it up or stress it out at all, one of its first defense mechanisms is to urinate on whatever is attacking it, even though you're trying to help it. Um, and that can be detrimental. In the middle of the summer, if it loses all that moisture, it, it's probably not going to find any. Oh my. So we say just, you know, keep your distance. Stop the car, let it cross, even if it goes slow. It may not seem like it, but the saguaro is a flowering plant. Yeah, these guys flower. April through June, you can see these beautiful white flowers that open up for local pollinators. The nectar provides wildlife like hummingbirds and bees a tasty sugary treat, and the pollinators help the saguaro reproduce. Later in the year, the cactus produces a juicy red fruit that have been enjoyed by wildlife and humans for thousands of years. When the fruit gets eaten, the seeds get dispersed. If you do visit saguaro, get an early start to your day. Temperatures can get really hot, especially in the summer. Carry lots of water, sun protection, extra snacks, and stay on the trail. The soil is filled with bacteria and fungi that help the plants grow and you don't want to step on them. And check the local fire restrictions. Forest fires can start and get out of hand really quickly and you don't want to be that person who burns down an entire national park just because you had to have a s'more. Besides, I think s'mores are kind of nasty anyways. Want to learn more about our national parks? Then hit that subscribe button, friend. Stay up to date and catch bonus features by following us on Instagram at Outsider.